great. So it's lovely to see how how far and wide you're all coming from, really, from a, really across the U, UK, which is amazing, isn't it? But modern technology allows that in this day and age. So welcome um, to our, in fact, our last uh, session of the term um, with Feldenkrais for musicians. And I'm going to just briefly give you a I'll try and make it brief, an introduction to Feldenkrais um, and what it is, what it can do and help us with. And then we're going to do a lesson um, which will actually be in sitting. Um, lessons can be in, and they are in many different positions. So a lot of them are in lying because then we change our relationship to gravity. That's very useful when we want to disturb habits. Um, and other lessons will be in sitting and standing, or for you know, just a whole range of different positions because it's part of what we learn in the first few years of our life is orientation in space. It's not necessarily something that we think about, um, but actually that's an important part of how we move ourselves in relation to ourselves and in relation to the world around us. Um, so as we go through, if there's anything you have a question on, do feel free to either unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Uh, if you don't understand something I say, don't, there are no stupid questions, just, just please do ask. So I'm going to share my screen with you and I'll just quickly take you through some of the ideas that we, we, will, we look at in, during this, uh, these sessions. So Feldenkrais method, for musicians, you can all see that, I hope. Just let me know if it's big enough. And just a brief thing about me, I'm a viola player, I play violin as well. And um, I come from a classical genre. I uh, do early music, so I've played with lots of different groups around Europe um, over the last 20 years. I'm also an amateur klezmer musician. Um, and I'm a Feldenkrais teacher, which I qualified in now, uh, how many years is that? Uh, seven years ago now. Um, and I wasn't really expecting that I would end up teaching Feldenkrais to musicians, but uh, I just thought I would add it into my kind of tools in the toolbox for teaching. But here I am, and I have to say I'm really enjoying it. So um, let's move on from me if we can make this work. Oh, yeah. So let's jump straight to some of the challenges that we all face as musicians. So many of you, uh, when I asked what, what were you interested in learning or what, what, what did you want from these sessions, many of you talked about pain, um, you know, that you wanted to play or live without pain or to feel better. Um, and that a lot of that obviously comes from the postures that we have to adopt when we play. Um, and, and again, many of you, and I, which is partly why I wanted to know what would you like from these sessions, many of you mentioned wanting to improve your posture, whether that was posture in general or posture in performing. Um, so we have long hours in, in challenging positions and limited movements, which of course leads to things like RSI and 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 tension within the body that can often lead to us having limited range of movements along with pain so the kind of physical factors and, and that's at the kind of the negative end of the scale if you like and of course at the positive end of the scale we've got how do we enhance our speed or how do we improve the coordination of what we do because really we are very much athletes of the small muscles so how can we use something like Feldenkrais not only to be um, rehab-esque, uh, but also to improve our ability and our skill. And uh, so from the challenges, I would say a lot of people come to, to these kind of methods for performance anxiety and dealing with the pressure of being on stage. I can see a few notes there. And, and what's interesting is that we know that stress is created by having high responsibility, but low control, low power. And often as musicians, we're in those situations, you know, you're in a group or you're in an orchestra, you've got a gig, and there, there's a limited amount of what you can do 
Um, and those psychological factors also affect the way that we move, the way that we, we think, um, the way that we feel. Um, and let's move on from that little one. Any, any questions, as I say, do you just either put them in? I won't be able to see your hands, so if you want to say something, then just unmute. That's fine. So self-pressure, something we all know about, like perfectionism. We've got a deadline when we perform. You know, it has to be ready by then. We have to be ready. We have to just do it. You know, um, we don't want to let other people down. Now, I, I, I know of people, of course, it's very extreme, but I know of people who have had miscarriages before they walked on stage and they just got up and went on stage because, you know, because they were part of a group and if they didn't do it, then, then the concert didn't happen. So, so sometimes, of course, that's very extreme, but, but we are, we're under pressure and we work antisocial hours and we're often tired because we've got travel as well as our performing. So just some of the factors that, that mean that what we do can be difficult. Of course, it's also very rewarding, otherwise hopefully we wouldn't be here. Um, so a little bit about the Feldenkrais method. Am I going, is this too fast or is this okay? It's okay, give me a thumbs up if that's all right. Okay, great. Yeah. So the Feldenkrais method, what is it? It's, it's a sensory motor movement method. It uses the way that we uh, organically learn. So if you think about when we were infants, you learned to roll onto your stomach without anybody telling you how. You learned how to get up onto all fours and then crawl in some way without anybody showing you how to do it. And finally, you got up and you walked, maybe because you saw other people doing it, but nobody showed you how to do that. And the same with learning a language, right? We, through experimentation with sound, over time, we all managed to learn to speak our mother tongue. Um, and we did that organically. We did that through the way in which we learn and um, through adaptation to improve what we're doing. And it's a, it's a, it's a kind of cycle of learning, if you like, that we have throughout our lives or can have throughout our lives, ideally. And it really works on the fact that there's no body mind split, like Descartes was wrong. We, we, it's body and mind together. We are an embodied brain, or you could, you could say we're a mindful body. In both ways, it doesn't really matter. It's one thing. And that's been proven now by neuroscience. So Marcel Feldenkrais was actually very much ahead of his time. Some people call him the father of neuroscience because he was really, through observation and through his knowledge of science as a physicist and engineer, he worked with Marie Curie in the, in the laboratories in Paris, splitting the atom. So he was a well-known scientist of his day in his field. Um, and it really works on this idea that we are one system, not, not a bag full of parts, as our language would have us believe. You know, yes, we've got arms and legs, but actually when we move, it's all one thing. So, and not only are we one thing, but we also have, if you like, four aspects of that. So every time you move, you have an emotion attached to it, a sensation and a thought. Or indeed, every time you think, you have a, some kind of movement, an emotion and a sensation. So this action pie, if you like, means that we can look at lots of different things, not just physical movement, but through the doorway of movement. And that's a much easier way for most of us to look at uh, psychology or, you know, or emotional habits um, without necessarily having to either revisit trauma or go down that path of, of um, talk therapy. Although for many people, that's also very useful. So I, I would say, and I would say Feldenkrais goes very well together if, if that's something that you are interested in, because it really, it can, when we do counselling or, or talk therapy, it can really miss out the body. So it's a way of really helping you get to know your full self, 
so that you have a better relationship with your body, really, and that it feels more one whole thing. Uh, okay, let's move on. So this is a very famous quote from Moshe, and um, and I think very beautiful, really. And in a way, it sums up what we do as musicians, right? We make the impossible possible. We learn to play an instrument or to sing from not being able to do it. And then over time, we refine that to making it easy and then hopefully elegant. So, and that's very much the, the process of learning uh, to, for any art form, I would say. So how can Feldenkrais help you all as performers? And it's a kind of spiral of learning, really. I often think learning Feldenkrais is like peeling off layers of an onion. Right. And, and so we improve your awareness through these exploration, this experimental lessons that look at how we relate parts of ourselves to other parts of ourselves, or indeed how we can think of all of our physical self at the same time. And we look to reduce the tension that you have. And often with that, I'll explain a bit more about that, comes a reduction of anxiety as we become more grounded in our physical self and more aware of not only our limitations, but our possibilities. When we are really in tune and we're able to listen deeply to our physical self, we can help ourselves with healing and injury prevention. And what we're really looking at in Feldenkrais is improving your self-image. And, and, and that's quite literal in that we creates a three-dimensional picture of ourselves in the brain. And so what we're moving in the brain is that three-dimensional picture, or it's what model really, because it's three-dimensional. But with all of us, we'll have parts of our physical self that are missing from that picture, or they're very vague. There's no detail there. Like if I ask you to think about your, your right foot, and then can you wiggle your third finger, uh, your third toe? Can you actually find your third toe in your mind's eye without touching it, without feeling it? And for many of us, that's something that's really hard. So if we don't have an awareness of the middle toe, that's going to affect how you use your feet, right? And if we can then bring more awareness to the to each toe individually and understand the um, the the physicality of the foot from an experienced it, from an experiential point of view, then we're going to use that foot differently, and hopefully in, in an improved way. So that's just one example, of course, of of many areas of ourselves. That, that we can improve our self-image in. And uh, as we grow awareness, as we reduce the tension, as we improve our self-image, we learn over time to work with our body, not, not against it. We learn what are the limitations of the human form and what are the limitations that we put on ourselves? What are the habits of our thinking that stop us from moving um, or doing in a, something in the way that we want to do it. So you can also think about it as we are making smaller the gap between what we're doing and what we think we're doing. You know, that's very much something that we look at in Feldenkrais. So it's, it's very much a process of learning. It's not something that we, we do necessarily just once and then leave, although it can be used like that for in, in, in crises, if we've got something going on, like you've hurt your back, yes, you can have one session and hopefully it will improve it. But in order for us to really evolve as, as humans, as musicians, then it, it becomes a practice. So, and you can imagine when we've got a better self-image, when we are aware of both our limitations and our potential, um, we can improve our stage presence. Because if, you, if we come back to that action pie, when we improve the way we organize our physical self, we're also helping to change and shift habits of how we think about our emotional self. 
And over time, we, we build resources for soccer so that we're really looking after ourselves physically. Um, and then we're back around. And, and so it's a kind of, it is a kind of circle of learning, of course. Um, and awareness, why is that important? Well, because if we don't know what we're doing, we can't change anything. If I don't know that I, my middle foot, my middle toe needs to be engaged in order to successfully run fast, then, then, and I can't feel that middle toe, then I can't use it well. So when we improve the awareness of, of ourself and we improve the knowledge of what we're doing, then we can, we can do what we want. Um, and we're really learning organically because we're using movement, which is very much the basic building block of human learning. And through um, through really this feedback system, this feedback loop we have of moving and sensing, and then the brain changing and its neural networks depending on what we have, what we've given it. So um, one of the things we're looking to do is to reduce tension. Maybe not as much as Mr. Koala here, because obviously he's asleep, but most of us do what we do with too much effort, with too much tension in the system. Um, and we want to do what's enough, not waste energy, because energy that doesn't go to making that action happen ends up being wear and tear on your skeletal system. So energy that over overworking is actually detrimental to the human body, which is a very different way to thinking than most of us get told throughout our lives. Like you can't do something, try harder. And we would say, no, if you can't do something, work smarter. So yes, we, we will be asking you to think more in a Feldenkrais lesson, but do less. So, and, and we are um, peeling those layers of the habits of how we work, whether that's over-efforting or anything else, so that we can recognize what we're doing and then we can do something about it. We can reduce what we're, the tension levels to just what you need rather than more than what you need. Or like Mr. Koala, less than you need, unless you're sleeping. Um, can I talk a little bit more or have you had enough? Just give me a thumbs up if you're happy for more. Okay, that's, so I'm really more of you would like are happy with a bit more. I'll just go on a little bit more and then we're gonna do some, some movement. Please continue, great. So anxiety, everything, everything we do is created in the brain or the mind, whichever way you like to think of it. And, and the brain controls the body. And, and what you see here in this picture is the nervous system, which has been taken out, which is extraordinary, isn't it? So the brain, obviously here, and the spinal cord are the main um, protagonists. And the, the nerve system, which to me always looks like a little bit like roots of a tree, is what the sensory feedback goes back through. So we've got nerves that go to all the extremities through pretty much all of the body, apart from a few places like you don't have nerve endings in your diaphragm or there are some places you don't have nerve endings internally. Um, and that acts as a kind of a, um, an information system. And the spinal cord, of course, is your information highway. And, and interestingly, there are different parts of the brain which act faster but we have less cognitive control over. So all of those times where you find yourself going backwards and then there's a car, and you nearly got run over, but you didn't. Or, um, you know, you take your hand off a hot plate before it gets burnt, and then you realise what happened. That's your autonomic system. If you like, some people call it your lizard brain because it's the oldest part of the brain. That's, that's all of the spinal cord in, in charge and it can react, but it can't respond. 
and that reaction rather than response is also part of your uh, amygdala, um, the way that that works to for your flight, fight, freeze response in, in terms of danger, if you like. So, and I'm just going to simplify it all because obviously I could talk for a long time just on the nervous system, but that's but um, and maybe we can talk about it another time in more detail. But essentially, the opposite network that we have, which isn't a fight flight, is a, what we call an amygdala hijack, is your direct sensation network. So when you um, touch yourself, so even if you just touch your hand and stroke your hand, the connection that you make between being aware of sensation and whether that's movement, it can also work with movement but or, and touch, it turns on your parasympathetic system. So it dials down the nervous system, down regulates, we call it. Um, and when you're in that mode, the other modes, your more active sympathetic mode gets turned off or more turned off, depending on what state it's in. So we can actually down regulate your nervous system by this kind of work as well and put you into a calmer state. And um, those of you who came to one of the last workshops, we were playing with what state do you want to be in before you go on stage? And for different people, that, that was very different. It was really fascinating. So for me, for example, I like to be very calm as I go on stage. I hate being overexcited. It stresses me out. Other people really love that kind of that energy, and that's what they need to do well on stage. And what, what's good about Feldenkrais is we're not saying you should be X or Y. We're saying let's explore the range of options. And then you will choose unconsciously what's right for you. So it's very much a system where we are allowing the, we're allowing the unconscious brain to do the decision making that it does, but we're giving more options of what you could do in order to have more choice, if that makes sense. So. Okay, we're going to jump ahead. So anxiety is often something people come to me for, as I mentioned. And the tools that we have, some of the tools that we have within Feldenkrais are these. So improved interception, which is, I think I spelled that wrong. Um, it's basically all of those internal sensations and emotions. So it's any and your thoughts. So when we understand the connections between our emotions and the way we hold ourselves, um, then we can start to learn what the triggers are. And then we can start to respond rather than react. Um, and when, when they've done studies on mindfulness practices, which Feldenkrais is one of, to improve people's interception, it's been proven to help with both uh, depression and anxiety, which is really interesting. So another thing I work with with people is grounding. So then you to be able to really feel your connection to the floor. So right now, really to feel, say, for example, your sitting bones and feel this. Uh, we learn to be much more aware of your pelvis rather than only the head. Most of us are very aware of our head maybe a bit around the neck and our hands, not so aware generally of the rest of ourselves in the same detail. So grounding is also about improving your organisation of breathing, which again, you can then start to self-regulate better and, and also changing mental patterns, like really starting to recognise which mental patterns you have, which mental thinking habits that you, we get into, those, those loops um, of thinking, which is something that the brain produces, it's called the default mode network, um, starting to be able to recognize when we get into those so that we can break our patterns of thinking as well as movement. Feldenkrais at one point said that he wasn't really looking for physical bodies, he was looking for 
No, sorry. He wasn't looking for flexible bodies. He was looking for flexible brains. And that's really what this work is about. So the better our connections are with the brain to all of the parts of ourselves, the better we can control what we're doing. It's like a, a drawing the dots, if you like. The more pixels we have in the picture in the 3D model of ourselves, the more accurately we can move ourselves and the more ergonomic we, um, ergonomically we can move ourselves, which over time does lead to less injury. Um, and we also have improved proprioception, which is our ability to sense ourselves in relation to the world around us. So to be able to feel the chair underneath your bottom or the ground underneath your feet, we improve your orientation of yourself in space and using this knowledge to, to move better. Oh, I think I did that twice, oops. But, uh, and, and that kind of accuracy of the body mapping, this 3D model, as I said, uh, improves how we can control movement of ourselves. Um, and improved neuromotor movement. I mean, everything essentially is neuromotor movement, everything we do whether that's just raising an eyebrow or a finger or doing a um, you know, pen of violin or something much more complex. But the more ergonomically we move, and, and you may well have heard that phrase, what fires together, wires together. So when we have patterns with extra tension, or let's say I'm playing, I'm doing a down bow, and every time I do a down or up bow, I, I, I tighten my mouth, that becomes a learned pattern of behavior. And it's almost like you've got too many, you've got like strands of thread of one color, and then you've added in all of those other unnecessary um, movements or tensions in a, in a different color. And what we do is we're, we're trying to take out everything that's unnecessary, what we call parasitic movements, because they, they don't actually help you do what you want to do. And that um, ergonomic movement really helps streamline what you're doing. So Feldenkrais is a practice and you can do it in very different ways. Um, if you have specific needs that can't be met in group classes, then I would suggest finding a practitioner who where you can do hands-on sessions, or if you're too far away, you can also do one-to-one -one work online. Um, weekly sessions, I recommend, obviously you've got our Friday sessions during term and you can do the videos on your own if you can't make Fridays usually. And then I would also recommend that when you're doing a weekly session that you take one or two movements from that, like just movements that particularly interested you in the lesson and spend a couple of minutes each day playing with that. Yeah. And if we do workshops and then that bigger immersion into this work can help us have a uh, ha it have a bigger impact and for the changes that we make to last a bit longer. Um, and then that's me. Um, if you want to find me on, on Twitter or anything, it's uh, the moving brain. Uh, that will be changing at some point. Great, that felt like a lot of talking. Um, any questions before we we do an actual lesson so those of you who haven't experienced this before can can go away with an actual experience do do you just put it in the chat or you can just unmute which you know bernie you've unmuted yourself did you want to ask something i, I will ask i was uh, wondering whether to do this. i'll be brief but it's a big topic but as you become more physically aware um you must mm. notice a point i know i do where you recognize that your mental state is compromising your physical state so you sort of reach a level mm -hmm. of relative proficiency awareness so do you how do you how do you then get your mind optimal or is that another whole life's journey <laughs> do you use well, I think when, we, when we don't think of them as separate then that can help right yes so i mean obviously it depends it's hard for me to generalize about what, what specific thing you might be talking about but if we know for example that the brain tends to loop itself so if we're thinking about thinking there's this default mode network. So anytime when, I don't know, somebody's been mean to you and you find yourself 
thinking about that situation and going around and around it, that's your default mode network taking over. And, it, and it's a kind of very slow spiral, right? Very often you'll find that people talk about something that's happened to them and they wind up. And that's something that the brain does itself. But when you know that, you can start to think, oh, oh I've got into that loop. My brain is uh, doing its thing. And so when we know that that's how the brain works, we can also be less, um, we can find it less personal. You no, know? sure. it's, not, it's not, oh, I've failed. It's, oh, that's how my brain works. So if I want to get out of that pattern of thinking, I have to, I have to just think about something else for a moment. So I know that's very simplistic answer to what you've asked. But it's that kind of thing where we start to understand more about how the how the mind works and how the brain works. And it, we don't need to obviously go into massive detail. It's not like we all need to be neuroscientists. But the more understanding we have of, of all of those systems, um, then the more easily we can we can affect changes. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yeah, very much. Thank you. Great. And that was Richard, wasn't it? Bernie, did you have a question? You've unmuted yourself. I was just going to say, you know, the exercises that you're going to do, is, yeah. that, is that something that you kind of do like a ritual every day or is it a couple of times a week or is it something you do when you feel a bit of stress, say in your shoulder or whatever? That's a really good question. So... I generally recommend a weekly practice of going to a lesson. However, the more you do, like anything, the more practice you do of anything, the better you get at it. So it's really, I would say, it has to be um, managed in a way that it can fit into your schedule. Yes. So if you have time and you can do an hour a day, well, fabulous. But if you don't have time, then, then do less. You could do, most of us can do a few minutes, even if you're just on the toilet, moving your shoulder and exploring. Yeah. Or as and I'll show you when we when we do this lesson that we're about to do, wow. um, you know, when we do these kind of movements as well, we can take just small aspects and explore. Oh, thanks. Is that, yeah, that, that, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Great. And, and it can also be something that, you know, you don't have regular time or, you've, or you don't want it to be a regular practice, then, of course, it can be something that you come to when you want it. I mean, you're all adults. You can all, we can all decide what, what fits for us. And, and, again, I think that's very much part of our thinking is that when we're learning, we have to be engaged in what we're doing or we don't learn well. So if... if if we force ourselves into, I don't know, doing it every day and we're not enjoying it or we're, we're, not, we're not in the mood that day, we can't focus, then better to go do something else and come back to it another time. Because it's like practice. We want to be able to focus on what we're doing. And I'm sure you'll feel that uh, as we go through. Um, in order to improve how the brain is working, how, how it's connecting. Great. Okay, uh, I'll just quickly look at what is it possible to have an active sympathetic and parasympathetic system? Um, I, I, I suspect that it is. I don't, I'm not, um, that I, let me come back to you on that with a bit more detail, Julia. Um, and hypermobility, yes, it can be very good with hypermobility. Um, often people who are hypermobile have a different problem than the rest of us in that. Most of us are kind of working on freeing up our movement. And for those of you who have hypermobility, you need to move in a way where actually you're looking for the pathway of support and structure. So that it's, it's because obviously if you've got um, amazing flexibility, you can make these movements, but it's like, where can you be supported by your skeleton? Great, so I'm going to ask you to come up to standing for a moment. We're going to do a reference movement without playing and then we'll do some something playing and then we'll do a, a lesson. <laughs> 